Okay, cool. Um, so we are going to be looking at marker gene profiling in this lecture and the lab. Um, a lot of you had questions earlier about things that I'm hopefully going to be covering here. Um, but if anyone wants to leap in with any questions at any point, then please go ahead. Um, so I hope that what I'm going to tell you about in this lecture um, and what you will understand by the end is um, a bit about amplicon sequencing, how that works, how we use the data, what we do with it. Um, you'll be able to differentiate the different amplicon sequencing targets that we might use. Um, we're going to focus on 16S today, and I imagine that's what many of you are focusing on your, in your research, but there are other targets. Um, you will hopefully be able to know the difference between different variable regions within the 16S gene um, and be able to outline the major bioinformatics steps in 16S data analysis, um, as well as understanding the basic outputs from processing 16S data and having an overview of, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our markdown notebooks and how they can be used to keep track of the code that you use um, just for helping with reproducibility of your data analysis. So there are kind of two key methods for studying the microbiome. Um, hopefully you're all fairly aware of that already, but essentially we have amplicon based and that's usually 16S, 18S or ITS and metagenome or metatranscriptome. Um, and these both have kind of benefits and weaknesses to them. And um, so in amplicon, we're amplifying a piece of DNA or RNA um, and that is the result of amplification via PCR. Um, we usually use it for sequencing um, a universal gene, and it's often called like DNA barcoding or metabarcoding. And it doesn't have to be a universal gene. It can be a gene that's just found in, you know, the taxa of interest. It might be a functional gene that you're interested in seeing which taxa contribute to it. Um, there are some different options there, but usually we're using it to identify the taxa in a sample. Um, and it tends to be restricted to organisms containing the gene targeted by the amplicon primers. Um, I mean, they may not be quite specific enough. That can be an issue that we run into. Um, but typically, host contamination isn't an issue if we've done a good job with primer design. Um, and then metagenome or metatranscriptome um, is really sequencing everything in the sample. Um, but you're able to look at both who is there and what are they doing, so taxonomy as well as function. Um, the main drawback is that host contamination can mean really high read depths are needed. Um, you know, if you're sequencing um, like feces, if you're looking at stool microbiome, for example, then it's got a really high microbial content. So you might not be so worried about host contamination for metagenome. But if you were doing saliva, you end up with a lot more human reads in the sample and you therefore need to sequence um, to a lot greater depth to be able to kind of get at what you're actually interested in. Um, and the comparison with databases is therefore a lot more complicated. There are a lot more unknowns um, associated with it. And of course, some of the key uh, deciding factors for this might be um, the price that it costs for those sequencing. Um, so if I've taken these prices from our inter integrated microbiome um, resource website, um, this is what we currently charge for all of these uh, services. And I think they're, probably on the cheaper end of what's normal, um, but fairly standard um, across a few kind of academic focused um, sequencing places. Um, yeah. Morgan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you get a lot for buying in bulk um, when they're doing that much sequencing. That helps. Um, Morgan, do you want to add anything more to that? Um, I mean, also, some of the kind of companies want you to use them um, and they can give kind of offers, but. But not as much on the management things. I think we're not as cheap in that area, but we're not going to 
yeah i mean i guess essentially like economies of scale <laughs> um but yeah so um we have the kind of different types of sequencing we can do um 16s 18s its short amplicons are probably still the most commonly used um these we're doing two by 300 base pair paired end sequencing and i will talk about that a little more in a minute um and yeah, the price is about $30 a sample and you're looking at approximately 15,000 read, uh, 50,000 reads, sorry, in most samples. Um, we then have the full length amplicons and that's now with PacBio SQL 2 long read. And again, I'm gonna talk about that slightly in a minute. Um, that's not much more expensive, but it's about 10,000 reads that are um, the circular consensus sequencing or hi-fi reads, they call them. Um, and then looking at metagenomes, we use the NextSeq 2000 for that. Typically, that's two by 150 paired end reads um, on the cell that we tend to use, the flow cell. Um, that's about $220 a sample, which will give you about 6 million reads. There are other options for more reads. Um, and this is kind of typical anywhere that, you know, you kind of essentially get what you pay for, <laughs> I guess. Um, and then there are other options like the long read sequencing for metagenomes. Um, if you just want to kind of profile a sample, then maybe you can do that for only about $300 a sample, which gives you two gigabases worth of data. Um, or if you're looking at assembling mags, uh, which I think the majority of you are staying for the next workshop, the advanced one, um, we'll talk more about that for mag assembly. Um, but that you can see there's a massive jump in price. You do also get a lot more data, um, but that's what you need to be able to have, you know, good overlaps of your reads in every area of a genome versus just having a rough idea of what's there and what the functions might be. Is that everyone following? Seems like everyone's nodding, that's good. <laughs> okay, um, so then if I get into what we are typically um, sequencing with Amplicon sequencing, um, I hope this is mainly a refresher for everyone. Um, ribosomal RNAs are non-coding RNA, which is the primary component of ribosomes, which are essential to all cells and therefore they're present in all living organisms. And um, they play roles in the processing and translation of proteins. They're organized into the small subunit and the large subunit, which are kind of abbreviated to SSU and LSU. Um, and one of each of these forms the ribosome. And in prokaryotic ribosomes, um, the large subunit is made up of the 23S and the 5S rRNA, um, which is about 3000 base pairs in total. Um, and the 16S rRNA makes up the small subunit and the 16S RNA gene is typically around 1500 base pairs long. Um, this varies a bit depending, um, and therefore what you're amplifying, the length of it can vary a little bit as well. Um, but what the main use of these and why they've become so widely used for sequencing and looking at the taxonomy is that they're really well conserved over time due to their role in ribosome function, and they're really rarely um, horizontally transferred. Um, so you typically have a really good idea of what is there um, with the taxonomy of the 16S gene. Um, they're really useful for phylogenetic analysis um, because changes in the genes kind of approximate um, overall genomic divergence. Um, and they can also be used to build trees either with the single gene, just the 16S gene, or you can incorporate multiple genes um, together to make nice phylogenetic trees like this one. Um, showing kind of all of the diversity of life. Uh, but the 16S gene is definitely still the most commonly used, especially for microbial research. Um, there are other... Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so there are other marker genes that are used as well. Um, if we are looking at bacteria, um, chaperonin 60 is used. Some people say that this is apparently better um, for it. I haven't personally got experience with it. I haven't compared kind of the utility of both, um, but there are other genes that are used and you know, maybe depending on your application, it's something that you might want to look into. And um, there are also things like the ammonia monooxygenase genes. So especially if you are interested in a particular function, this is often used in um, environmental research like ammonia monooxygenase or nitrogenase if you're looking at nitrogen fixation. Um, you might want to know which taxa contribute to this function that you're interested in, in your sample. Um, and DNA gyrase is used as well. Um, if you're looking at eukaryotes, um, typically you might be looking at the 18S RNA gene for protists, 
or other kind of unicellular eukaryotes, um, or the ATS2 gene for fungi. Um, viruses don't have any universal marker genes, so that's where really you just need to use metagenomics for them. Um, so going back to the 16S gene, um, the reason that we use it so much um, is that it contains nine hypervariable regions, as, and these are kind of flanked by really well-conserved regions. Um, different variable regions do have different taxonomic resolutions and biases. Um, but if we look at this figure, um, so along the bottom, we've got um, the whole 16S gene, so about 1,500 base pairs. Um, and you can see within it the different variable regions. So on the y-axis, this is kind of how, con how well conserved or how well not conserved um, the gene is in these regions. So in these very variable regions, it's really not conserved at all um, between different species. But you have these nice conserved regions in the middle that allow you to design primers that target them. Um, but because they are slightly different, because some of them are more conserved than others, um, they give slightly different community composition results. Um, so if you were thinking about the biases that you might be introducing in any pipeline, this is definitely something that you might want to consider. Um, and just to give a little overview, um, some of the really commonly kind of targeted regions, and I apologize, this is a little bit small, I wanted to fit everything on there. Um, <laughs> But some of the most common is the V4 to V5 region. This is kind of seen as the like universal um, marker gene. And you can see on the right-hand side, roughly the percentages of different groups like archaea, bacteria, cyanos, eukarya that you'll be targeting. But what you'll notice with the universal one is that you're also actually targeting quite a lot of eukaryotes as well as mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA. Um, whereas there are some other kind of, they call them bacteria specific primers. Um, that target a different region that really you're not picking up very much of these other groups at all. Um, so this is just something that you kind of need to bear in mind and consider when you're thinking about how to design your experiments, I guess, and which area that you might want to sequence. Um, and then this is just again from that same study that um, they had a look at um, taking out the 16S RNA gene from databases and seeing how well um, you can differentiate taxa back to um, the taxa that they're from based on just different regions of the gene. Um, so if you use the entire gene, um, then really you're able to classify all of your taxa back to the species level. Um, but for the different regions, um, you see the more red means that there's more unclassified. Um, and so for like the V4 region especially, you're actually not able to get down to a particularly good taxonomic resolution using just that region. Um, is that making sense to everyone? Great. Um, so then briefly, I was just gonna show how the community composition results can vary if you sequence different um, regions of the gene. So here, this is kind of the mock community. This is the composition that you know the community should be. If you sequence the V4, V5 region, um, then you have quite an overabundance of the bacteroides in yellow. Um, but if you sequence the V6, V8 region, you end up with a lot more propioni bacterium. Um, and just so it's just worth bearing in mind that especially if you want to compare your results with a different study, if they use a different variable region, then, I mean, you could have the same community and it still looks different. Um, it's just something to account for. Um, and then another thing on the variable region is that some different very large studies have used different regions. So the Human Microbiome Project um, sequenced all samples with the V3, V5 region, um, and then some different subsets with either the V1, V3, or V6, V9. But because they use the V3, V5, loads and loads of other studies use these same primers. But I mean, as we saw previously, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting the best taxonomic resolution. It means you can compare really easily with that study if you use the same primers. Um, well, exactly um it's really difficult like you definitely don't want to like switch up in the middle of a project or something um i mean that's going to completely vary the results but i mean 
some better than others. Yeah. Like it's difficult, but then, I mean, you know, you probably, there's not a single study that you want to compare with. You want to compare with multiple other studies that did similar things and they may all use different primers. Um, well, that was kind of what some of these tried to get at, but then as you see, like they're not necessarily the best technology changes. Um, you know, MySeq used to be two lots of 250 base pair reads, so you needed a shorter region. Um, now you can sequence longer. Now, you know, full length 16S is coming about, but then that still has a different bias. Then it's still not like easy to just like, you can kind of chop the longer reads down and just look at the region that overlaps, but you've still amplified it using those primers. So you're still not looking at the exact same thing. So there's not really a perfect solution. I wouldn't say, um, but it's just kind of all things to consider when you're wanting to compare with these other ones. You know, it might be like, oh, this study found these texts that are really important in this disease, but then your primers might not pick it up at all. Like that's something to consider beforehand. Um, and yeah, so you can see these two massive projects, the human microbiome project and the earth microbiome project, they both use different sets of primers. So just wanted to kind of highlight that as things to consider. Um, okay, so Illumina sequencing, which is what we're gonna focus on for this um, workshop. Um, it has a couple of different steps. So you have the first step where you're doing PCR with the taxa primers and a second step where you're attaching indexes to um, that product. Um, and that kind of makes your library, it's called. Um, so in this case, you might be sequencing some of the V4, V5 regions. So you have primers that target, you know, roughly these variable regions within the 16S rRNA gene. Um, and then you have some other primers that will attach to uh, the taxa primers. And that's kind of in how we design the primers that there's an area that they overlap with. Um, and that's a second amplification step, but you're just attaching the indexes that the MySeq sequencer is going to be able to read um, and identify back to the sample that it came from. Um, so they will be unique to the sample that they came from. Um, and then if I just go on here, those index primers um, actually have another little sequence attached to them, the P5 or the P7, and that tells um, the sequencer about whether it's a forward or a reverse read. Um, so I'm not going to go super in depth in kind of the Illumina chemistry here, um, but that's essentially how it's set up. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Like, is there anything anyone wants me to elaborate on there? Otherwise, I feel like you could kind of do a lecture in itself on like sequencing chemistry, but okay, good. <laughs> All right, so Illumina MySeq sequencing, you have roughly two by 300, well, you have two by 300 base pair reads. You get between one and 25 million reads per run, typically, um, usually 23 to 24 million with about 21 to 22 million passing your quality filter. And typically in a run, you have um, four by 96 well plates, so 386 samples, and they all get combined into like one liquid of about well, it's such a few microliters that you actually add. It's like five microliters and then you're actually sequencing that has all of your samples together in that one thing. So that's why you need the indexes attached to be able to identify the reads back to the sample they came from. There are, of course, other sequencing technologies. Um, and just to go through really briefly, uh, the kind of first was Sanger sequencing that came about in 1977. And the first automation of it was 1987. Um, these all work slightly differently. Sanger was fluorescently labeled dideoxynucleotides that are detected by a laser after capillary electrophoresis to generate a sequence chromatogram. So when you see the graphs that have these kind of squiggly lines, um, that's what's generated by the Sanger sequencing. Um, pyrosequencing is kind of referred to as second generation sequencing. Um, and that was slightly different. Again, luminescence generated as a result of pyrophosphate synthesis during sequencing. And the 454 Roche sequencing, which was used quite a lot for a while, is automated pyrosequencing. Um, then we have the nanopore, which is the long read sequencing. And that was from their platforms, gridiron, minion, or the flongal. Um, and that uses changes in electrical conductivity that occur when DNA strands pass through biological nanopores. 
Um, and then we have Ultima Genomics, which is just kind of another company, and they were the first $100 genome. Yes. Um, my se sequencing is kind of, it came reasonably late through Illumina. Um, I don't really want to go through this in detail. I just wanted to give kind of some overview of when these sequencing technologies have come about and how they differ. Um, but essentially, most of the time now, we're looking at HiSeq, uh, MySeq, HiSeq, NextSeq, or NovaSeq. Um, and you can see that you could kind of use any of these for most applications, but they all have different strengths. Like some of them are shorter, but you get more reads from them. Um, the MySeq is longer, but you don't have as many reads as you get coming out of these other ones. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's really the key differences between them um, in terms of application. So then the other main one is the PacBio uh, long read sequencing. Um, and this has been around a while, but it's really being used a bit more lately because it's now got a lot more accurate. So when it came out, they had you know multiple KB lengths, but only about 85 to 90% accuracy. Um, and I think Illumina is above, I think Illumina says 99.7% accuracy in the reads. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this is obviously a very big difference between them. And I would say that's why it wasn't used previously as much. Um, but recently they've come out with their circular consensus sequencing, which can give you 99 to 99.9% .9 reads and they call these hi-fi reads. Um, and essentially you can see that you go from double-stranded DNA, um, they have some library prep steps, the DNA gets circularized and essentially it just keeps sequencing the circle of it. And eventually you've kind of overcome that 85 to 90% accuracy because you've sequenced the same region so many times that you shouldn't be having errors in the same region every single time. Um, so you can see now that they're saying that their hi-fi reads are both long and accurate. And for these, there's, you know, 16S, the full length 16S, which covers a reasonable proportion of bacteria, not all of them definitely. Um, and then there's also 18S and ITS that you can do the full, like a full length sequencing of as well. Um, yeah. That's a good question. I'm I haven't used nanopore sequencing myself, so I don't want to say wrong. Like Morgan, do you know? If there's an equivalent to kind of the high fi reads in nanopore. Uh, my understanding is no. You can get two D reads where it sort of reads once once or twice, but the uh, as far as I understand it, that uh, it's not applicable. You don't get as much precision. But no, a error has gotten better uh, substantially. And people want to ask for people to like go in and have a fun, but. <laughs> but there is going to be some errors there. So it wasn't like they were. Yeah, I mean, I. Yeah. Um, yeah, so essentially, this is what I was going to say on the kind of sequencing end itself. And now we'll move into more how we analyze the sequencing data. Um, so there are many different platforms or tools that you can use for marker gene analysis. Um, we're talking about 16S, but I think most of these are applicable no matter which you were using. Um, so the kind of two biggest are definitely Chime 2 and Mother. Um, Mother used to be used a lot. Um, people haven't been using it quite as much in the last few years, I think just because Chime two became so developed and there are so many people that contribute to it uh it's like there's loads and loads of people working on it whereas mother it's kind of just one guy that's um upkeeping it himself so um just not quite as much support there i guess um but it's that's not to say that it's not also a good way of doing things um 
like yeah chime two is kind of very straightforward i don't i didn't find mother particularly difficult to use either um there are other options that are definitely not as much um don't see as much use um so there's the data two pipeline tutorial i'll talk about data two slightly in a minute um but basically that runs entirely through in r there are options like that that don't use kind of a computing cluster you could maybe do it more locally um microbiome analyst um i forget the university that the person that developed this is from but it is canadian unfortunately they've misspelled microbiome analyst in their logo but <laughs> um they um essentially it's a little bit easier that you can upload your data to the website and run through it there for you obviously fewer options for customizing things but um maybe more user friendly because you're not needing the command line experience that, that you need for the other ones um and then i saw this paper that came out uh, lotus 2 uh, it says it's a highly accurate tool for amplicon sequencing analysis but i have no experience of that myself so i can't really say how good or bad it might be um but we are mainly focusing on chime 2 um you will see that chime 2 has a really nicely documented website it comes out with updates to it very frequently um there are two main components of it chime 2 docs and chime 2 view um so the docs really kind of explains what each part of it is doing and Chime2 View is a website where you can view some of the files that you get from Chime2, um, that they're in kind of their own special format, but that viewer is made for them to give you kind of the interactive view of it. Um, so essentially Chime is a start to finish microbiome analysis, um, and it's built on um, a lot of plugins that are made by different people. Um, some of them have standalone tools, um, but they've integrated them into Chime, which sometimes has less functionality than the standalone tool, um, but a lot more user friendly, typically. Um, and the files that you use for Chime are kind of nice because they track their provenance. So they track what you have done to that file in the previous steps. Um, and there are two main file formats, um, which, I mean, Morgan was talking about compression before. These are kind of different types of compression for storing the data. And this is what they've come up with for it. Um, but you have the extension .qza, and that's an artifact file. It's something that you use for analysis. It's the files that you'll be working on. And then qzv, and that's a file that you can just use for visualization, but you won't be performing any more kind of um, commands on the qzv file. That's kind of the end output for each bit. Does that make sense? Great. Um, so then I just wanted to talk a little bit about Microbiome Helper. Um, this is a GitHub and kind of wiki website that our lab has developed and we maintain. Um, and it's just really a bunch of different workflows for microbiome analysis. So we have... Um, the workflows that we are currently using for amplicon sequencing analysis, metagenome analysis. We often have the um, kind of workshop documents from old workshops that we've run. Um, and we update that as much as possible. Um, and you can also see the previous versions of the analysis that we were doing in the past. So this was published in 2017. Um, for the last at least three or four years, we've been talking about doing a second version and it still hasn't happened, but one day maybe you'll see that. Um, but essentially we just have a lot of different workflows and some tutorials um, that can be useful. And that's kind of what we're basing this workshop around those tutorials that we do. Um, and we also attach to it, have a Google group. Um, so that's linked from it. In there, you can ask questions. Um, one of us may answer, someone else in the community might decide to answer, but it's quite a nice place to get some input on analysis that you might be wanting to do or something like that. And um, so I just wanted to mention that there. Um, so then when we move on to the bioinformatics workflow, um, I'm gonna go through each of these steps in a bit more detail, um, but essentially you are taking your sequence data, your FASTQ files, um, as well as your metadata, um, and the sequencing data is going through a bunch of different steps before it's kind of ready to be combined with the metadata at the end, essentially. Um, so you have a pre-processing step where you are demultiplexing your samples. So you're working out which sample each of your sequences came from based on those indexes. Um, 
you remove the primers, you might be joining the reads together and you'll be quality filtering um, in this pre-processing step as well. Then you have denoising. Um, and this can be generating either OTUs or ASVs. Um, there are a few different pipelines and options. I'll go through some of those in a minute. Um, at the end of that, you have representative sequences. Um, so this is kind of, you're hoping that this is all of the unique sequences within your sample and you have counts of them within each sample. Um, once you have that, you can use those sequences for taxonomic assignment um, and building an ASV table that you then might want to you know, collapse at different levels. You might be wanting to look at it at the genus level or the family level, or you know, people don't tend to use the ASV level quite so much because it's not really clear whether that's um, you know, slightly different, slight differences in the sequence within the same strain even. Um, and again, I will go through that slightly more. Um, or whether, you know, it's an entirely separate species, which tends to be why people might collapse at the genus level. That seems to be the lowest level that people are really confident in the assignment. Um, but alongside that, you can also use the sequences for alignment and phylogenetic analysis. So building a tree with them. And typically, for, um, Morgan will go through this a bit more tomorrow, but typically for um, 16S data, and especially short amplicon regions, they're not really long enough on their own to build a good tree. So you are often inserting them into a tree that's already made. Um, and then with your ASV table and your phylogenetic tree and your metadata, you can do your downstream um, analysis and visualization. So what we're aiming to get to in this workshop session is the kind of ASV table stage of this. Um, so going through a bit more step by step, the sample demultiplexing, um, as I mentioned previously, with the Illumina sequencing, you're attaching barcodes to each of your sequences that tells you which sample they came from. And the way that you set this up is you have a unique sequence for each of your rows and unique sequences for each of your columns. And therefore, each combination in your 96 well plate is a unique combination of the two. And luckily, most um, sequencing platforms do this step for you. So the sequencing data that you get at the end of an Illumina run it just gives you a file for each sample. You don't have to deal with a file that has all of the samples, all of the sequencing data in it. Um, and yeah, OK, I think I covered everything that was said. Does that make sense? OK. Um, so then next we get to the quality filtering and I'm just going to skim through this really quickly because Morgan did cover it earlier and you did it in that workshop. But um, basically this looking to just maybe discard sequences that are below some certain quality cutoff um, threshold. You might be looking at um, certain points within them. Um, and as you hopefully saw, the forward reads are always slightly higher quality than the reverse reads. Um, I'm actually not 100% sure of the reason for that, but it's the same in every analysis. It's not something to be concerned by. Um, and this quality always goes down slightly across the length of the read. Um, this is normal and not to be concerned about as long as you're not seeing a really sharp drop off. You know, if at 100 base pairs, you're, you've got quality down in this red area, that's probably a concern with the sequencing run. Um, as long as it's looking kind of fairly standard, then you shouldn't have too much to be concerned about. Um, and that kind of comes into rejoining then, um, that while you do have this quality drop off at the end of the reads, because you're joining the reads together, it's not so much of a concern. Um, so when you have something like your Illumina sequencing, you're looking at roughly, um, depending on the region that you've sequenced, a 550 base pair total PCR product, including your taxa primers and your index primers. And you have a forward read that's 300, ba 300 base pairs that's sequencing in this direction and a reverse read that's sequencing in the other direction. So you can see that you have this overlapped area in the middle and that's what you're using to join it together. So you're hoping that that area is the same in your sequences that come from the same organism. And you want to have a decent chunk there that's enough that you can really be sure that you've joined the right sequence together again. Um, and there are you know, different programs that can be used for this. 
Chime 2 typically uses one called vSearch. There's another one called Pair. Um, and usually when you're running this command in Chime, you will give um, a region that you want to be overlapped, like a minimum uh, region of overlap, and also a small number of mismatches that you're kind of accepting as okay. Um, because you do have, you know, sequencing is not perfect. You don't have 100% accuracy. Um, yeah. No, you, well, I mean, these programs do it for you, essentially. Yeah, yeah i mean so i have done that when you know something didn't work very well in sequencing maybe um i have just used the forward reads um because if the reverse reads are really low quality like if something went wrong then um you might not be able to overlap them with the forwards very well and you don't know if you're kind of can chain I, can that call the question the whole sequencing around now it could it could but i mean there could also be some contaminant that was in there that affected how your sequencing worked so that doesn't necessarily mean they were all terrible and different people have a different cutoff that they want things to be like I've worked with some other people that just wanted such high quality for everything that they only want to work with the really high quality bit and they would prefer to just lose half the sequencing data than risk it being slightly lower quality um kind of depends <laughs> yeah oh definitely um i mean there's always like unfortunately experiments aren't usually perfect yeah, so <laughs> sometimes if you've spent a bunch of money sequencing things you might not be able to redo it you might not have anything left you can sequence you might just have to work with what you've got um yeah i mean there are many things that it's about kind of mitigating how bad it went <laughs> whatever like you don't really know. It's difficult to say. Um, and yeah, it might be that you're accepting just having a shorter amplicon that's all higher quality, but knowing that you probably can't classify that to, um, you know, a lower level because it's shorter. So you just haven't got the resolution there. Um, it's better than nothing. Exactly. <laughs> but you're just, you've got to be aware of the limitations of it, I guess. Did that answer the question as well? Yeah. Okay. Great. So once you have joined the reads together, um, or sometimes the rejoining comes within this step, um, then we look at denoising. And so with denoising, you're aiming to uh, work out what the errors from your sequencing were and kind of correct them. So there are two main approaches to this. Um, OTU, which an OTU is an operational taxonomic unit, and most people consider this to be kind of somewhat equivalent to a species. Um, and there are different options within this as well. This used to be used a lot more, and now I would say typically majority of people are using ASVs or amplicon sequence variants. So with OTUs, you are clustering together similar sequences um, at a set identity. So you might be looking for 97% similarity between the sequences, and then you're saying this is all the same OTU. Um, and you can do that as de novo clustering, so kind of clustering all just all of them together based on only what's in your sample. Or you might be using closed or open reference uh, clustering. So the closed reference is where you're giving it a reference database to kind of work out what's similar to that database, um, and you're not accepting anything new. And the open reference might be, okay, well, we haven't got 97% similarity with the database, so this is going to become its own OTU now. Um, and so, yeah, obviously collapsing at 97%, you are losing information, um, but collapsing at 100% uh, allows a single error to become a kind of entirely new taxon, which isn't great either. Um, and so then the newer approach, I guess, kind of as computing has 
moved along um, is ASV or Amplicon sequence variants. And there you're aiming to uh, model and correct the sequencing errors that you have. And so there are different um, ideas for this, like DADA2. I'm actually not sure if I'm saying DADA2 correctly. That's how I've always read it. <laughs> but I've heard different people call it something different. Um, but anyway, this, I've just like got the people that kind of developed these tools here. But DADA2 essentially is taking information from an entire sequencing run and attempting to model the errors that came from that sequencing run and collect and correct for them. So when you're running it, you need to run all of the samples that came from the same sequencing run together. Um, but if there was a second sequencing run that you did with your samples, you would run those separately. Um, but many times you don't actually have information about the sequencing run that something came from. That might not be what you're given when you get your samples back from somewhere. Um, and deblur is another option that does each sample on a sample by sample basis. So it doesn't take any of that other information. Um, and so then just to uh, go into that slightly, if you're looking at OTUs or operational taxonomic units, mm -hmm. yeah. It's different. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that different. <laughs> I'll, I'll show a graph in a second that shows some slight differences. Um, but yeah, essentially, if you are thinking of um, kind of your real sequences being these blobs with kind of abundance and differences here, um, when you sequence them, you might get something that looks more like this middle figure. Um, and by clustering at a certain percentage identity, um, as you do with OTUs, you can see how you might be combining together two taxa that are very similar to one another, but are actually slightly different. Um, with ASVs, you may be kind of correcting your errors reasonably well, but you could still end up with some extra um, taxa there just because it's not perfect. Um, no approach is really perfect. And so when it comes to choosing a denoiser to use, because um, I think most people um, have kind of decided that denoising rather than collapsing into OTUs is probably a better approach. Um, yeah, you then have the issue of choosing the denoiser. And so uh, Jacob, who was a previous PhD student in the lab, did a comparison a few years ago called denoising the denoisers. Um, and what you essentially find is, you know, if you have this expected composition on the left, you get slight differences depending on the pipeline that you use, uh, whether it's DADA2, Dibler, Unoise, another option, um, or collapsing into OTUs. Um, and if you look at the total number of um, ASVs or OTUs, you tend to find that with OTUs, you end up with a lot more than you do with ASVs. Um, I know in projects I've looked at with OTUs, I've had like 70,000 unique OTUs apparently, but if I denoise, it's about 6,000. Um, difficult to say without knowing the real answer, what that should be, um, but just kind of something to be aware of that there are differences. Um, and again, it's something that you might not want to change in the middle of your project um, once you've decided on an option. Um, so after you have denoised, you essentially have a table of data. Um, so you have ASV names um, down here, and Chime calls them all OTUs, regardless of whether they are OTUs or ASVs. Yeah. Or is it maybe not? No, no. I've never personally done that. I don't really know how it would work because I think I thought that algorithms were kind of designed to work with the raw sequencing data. And I don't like, I really know how that would change. Or do you mean you would run it separately? Right. Yeah. I mean, why not? Um Yeah, it's difficult to say. I mean, I guess you can kind of hope for some consensus. Um, but yeah, I haven't personally done that. But yeah, I don't I don't see why not. Um, I mean, and another thing, it's good to know kind of what your options are, I guess. Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, so you essentially have a table of ASVs. And so, for example, uh, these are your samples along the top. And you will have the number of reads that you have assigned to each ASV within each sample. 
Um, and this is how the ASVs tend to be named. Um, and this is because it's their MD5 sum. And this is essentially kind of a way of compressing information and checking whether, like often you use it for checking whether two files are identical to each other. It's kind of a tool that's developed for that. So each sequence would always become the same number string of characters, I guess, however you want to call this. But this is really not a nice way to read things. <laughs> If you're trying to compare, you know, if you're writing a results section of a paper and you're trying to talk about the taxa in your sample, it's not a great way to use this. I once reviewed a paper that did do this and it was awful. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, they they kept it and they were like, well, we think it's more reduce reproducible. I was like, maybe, but I really can't remember what it was in the previous paragraph versus the next paragraph you're talking about. So. Yeah, I mean, people people do things. Uh, doesn't mean that everyone else has to like it, I guess. So what we tend to do is uh, assign everything an ASV number. Um, and I mean, you could just use Excel to fill this in for you if you want. You can do it programmatically. Essentially, as long as you have some kind of link between your ASV ID and therefore the DNA sequence that it came from and the ASV number, then it doesn't really matter you can call it whatever you like. Um, yeah, so once you have this, then you've got your kind of ASVs or your sequences. Usually we want to assign some taxonomy to them. Um, there are different tools that can be used for this, um, different classifiers. There is the RDP classifier, NCBI BLAST. Um, I haven't actually used RTAX. Uh, I think Morgan had that in a previous slide but I haven't personally used it. And then the naive Bayes classifier tends to be what a lot of people use now. It's kind of a machine learning approach where you essentially have given it your database of taxa that you know the taxonomy for, and you want your classifier to compare your sequences to what's in that database and tell you the taxonomy of your sequence. Um, and then there are different databases that can be used. Um, so there is the... RDP database, uh, and so sorry, RDP stands for Ribosomal Database Project, I think. Um, there's one called Green Genes, Silver. You have the NCBI or GTDB databases, um, which tend to be more metagenome focused, but you can use for um, other classification as well. Um, and what you're wanting to get at the end of this is a ranked taxonomy. So for each of our ASVs that we have, we want to know what taxon like what the taxonomy of those is. Um, and so what we usually get out of this is another table that tells us, you know, in this case, it was able to classify this species, this um, ASV down to the genus level. Um, and it did that with pretty high confidence, um, with one being perfect. Um, and then in this case, it was actually able to also classify it down to the species level, but it's not quite as confident. Um, so we don't tend to do much with these confidence scores, um, but it's kind of nice to be aware that they exist. Um, yeah, you may well do it. Maybe like, okay, if it was above this threshold, then I just want to take the genus level. Um, and yeah, exactly. You kind of work backwards um, and you can usually set those, sorry. Yeah, you can. I mean, I don't know how if, E values are what's given by some of the like machine learning classifiers. Blast. Yeah, BLAST does definitely. Yeah, so I mean, if you were using that, BLAST tends to be a bit difficult for something like this because there are so many similar taxa sometimes that um, having something that has, you know, some different way of comparing tends to be good. Um, but yeah, you can use various different, it's kind of like quality filtering. You can use various cutoffs and what you decide is a is good for one application might not be the same as a different application. Um, Can you use both like blast and then, uh, for example, then with a uh, something like that and then combine them? I wouldn't necessarily combine them because sometimes things might be the same sequence in different databases, but called something different. So just because they're different doesn't mean it, like one is wrong or the other. Um, I would often like what you get from, so I mean, we'll do it in the workshop, 
um, what you get from the silver uh, with the naive base classifier, you might want to verify a couple of those by um, using the BLAST online tool and checking if you still get the same answer or at least a similar answer. Well, you don't usually do both. There's just different options. I mean, in almost every step of bioinformatic analysis, there are different options, there are decisions you have to make. Ultimately, there's not all, there's not usually a right or wrong answer. You just kind of need to know why you've made a decision. Be able to justify exactly. <laughs> Be able to defend that decision. <laughs> yeah. Um, and different people like different things. So, I mean, yeah, I've had things classified um, in a paper and then been asked to blast a load of it. It's like, well, actually, blast gives me 20 different hits that are apparently all as good as one another. So how am I supposed to choose from that? Um, you could like refine your database that you send your blast into. Exactly. I'll talk about that in just a second. <laughs> but yeah, okay. So then, uh, yeah, talking about some different taxonomy databases, um, for 16S, we tend to be using one of these ones. Um, so the RDP database tends to be most similar to the NCBI taxonomy. Um, it has its own classification tool. Um, the most recent version is 19. And that I tried to compare the number of sequences in each, but it was actually really difficult to get kind of solid numbers on this. Um, but essentially, it seems to have almost 25,000 sequences from about 19,000 species. Silver, um, it kind of tends to be the most used because it seems to be the most kind of curated and kept up to date. There's a lot of taxonomists that work with it. They combined with GTDB taxonomy fairly early on. Um, they also release a phylogenetic tree with each version, which is kind of nice. Um, but the latest version was actually quite a long time ago now, but it did have a lot of sequences. And it's kind of interesting because not all of these have a full genome associated with them. So you couldn't necessarily take the genome from NCBI for every single one of these sequences. And I think it's because they've been kind of built up over time. So it's just kind of different. Um, you have the green genes database as well, which it used to be really widely used. People had kind of stopped using it for a long time because they didn't update it between 2013 and kind of 2022, 2023. So it's kind of like, well, this is really, really out of date because we've sequenced so many more things since 2013. Um, and it wasn't that useful. But then eventually they came out with an update um, that the update kind of says it's 2022, but it was 2023 when the paper came out and therefore everyone saw it. Um, and it seems that that's about 21 million sequences from what I could tell from that paper. Um, so there's options and depending on the environment that you're sequencing, what you're using, you may want to choose different things based on that. Um, there are also special taxonomy databases. Um, sometimes uh, metagenomic databases or tools are being used um, and developed to kind of classify the sequences. So this was showing that Kraken2, which is usually a metagenomic taxonomic classification tool can also be used for 16S. Um, of course, in every paper that introduces an idea, they say it's the best thing ever, but really you probably need to compare it with something else or have someone else do a comparison. Um, and a lot of it really comes down to the parameters that someone has used as to which tool they find to be best. Um, so, but it's just worth considering that there are options out there. Um, you also have really specific databases that can be used for different applications. So this is the human oral microbiome database that I've taken this from. Um, it may provide better taxonomic resolution in certain circumstances, but it's just worth bearing in mind that it could be limited. I mean, something like the human oral microbiome, hopefully it's reasonably well characterized. There's probably been loads of things isolated from it, like a majority, but you could still have something that isn't in a database because it hasn't been um, found in the oral microbiome so much in the past. Um, and there's also like this paper was more focused on metagenomics, but having overly focused databases sometimes leads to false positives, because if you're trying to say what in this database is my sequence the most similar to, you might end up with something that is actually not really similar to at all, but it's more similar to that one than anything else in the database. Does that make sense? <laughs> 
Okay, and so this paper essentially, um, it's kind of interesting. It's published based on the data of some other people from the same university. Um, and I think they sequenced the gut microbiome of um, Hasda hunter-gatherers. And they had found some really interesting things. They were like, oh, we found these kind of crazy taxa in there. And so they redid this with a database that consisted of only reptiles for the gut microbiome. Um, and they found loads of uh, tree frogs and turtles in these uh, gut microbiomes. So it's just really showcasing how if you have a database that's really inappropriate for your use, you might still find things in there. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are. Like if you have a really crazy result, maybe think about that. <laughs> It could be if they weren't like Amazon rainforest tree frogs. <laughs> That's essentially what the paper finds that, you know, it's these kind of crazy taxa that there's no way in the world that they are actually in these gut microbiomes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this was more metagenome focused, but it's just kind of a nice example that if you use, yeah, if you use an inappropriate tool, you might get a result, but it doesn't mean it's right. Um, so then usually we have some more filtering that we do. Um, you might have contaminant ASVs. You know, if we're looking at 16S, you might have mitochondria and chloroplasts. You'll see in our universal primers, um, you know, 0 to 20% eukaryotes. Usually bacteria are kind of numerically dominant in what you're looking at, but you do have cases where you get, um, I mean, I saw it in COVID samples, for example, COVID nasal swabs, where we actually had loads of human DNA in the samples and it was a massive pain. We couldn't analyze anything <laughs> eventually, but these things do happen. Um, and so we usually filter them out at this step because what we are interested in is the 16S. Of course, you may be interested in those other sequences, in which case don't filter them out. But in most cases, when we're looking at the bacteria and that's what we've tried to sequence, then we want to filter out the other stuff. Um, you might have other quality filtering criteria as well. We often remove samples with low sequencing depth. Typically, our cutoff might be 1,000 to 5,000 reads. So that tends to be where we find that it all gets a little bit junky and it was just because the sequencing didn't work versus there just being kind of fewer reads in the sample to begin with. Um, and you might filter out things that are not very prevalent. For example, if they're le present in less than 10% of samples, um, this is something that changes based on your application. It might be that you think um, it's not likely to be kind of a real sequence. It could be some kind of artifact from your sequencing process. Um, and it, But it could be just that you're often trying to maybe reduce the burden of multiple test correction in stats that you don't want to have loads of things that are only present in one sample um, because it's just not very useful for you to be able to look at that, that way. Um, and then I put this first, but I'm talking about it last, um, the bleed through ASVs from sequencing. Um, Illumina kind of report this, but that based on previous sequencing runs, you can get some bleed through of other samples that, I mean, you're using the same indexes over and over again, just on a different flow cell within the sequencer, but they report it's below 0.1% of the mean sample depth. So often we will cut off ASVs that are below 0.1% of the mean sample depth. Um, there is someone in our lab that has been doing a comparison of this. He's been saying for three or four years now, it's almost ready, it's almost ready, <laughs> uh, but we haven't seen it yet. But um, just to kind of be aware that that's why we often filter out the very low abundance stuff um, because it could be from a previous sequencing run. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, so yeah, 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 you will see in the workshop, most of this stuff that we're doing, like all of these steps that I've talked about, really, you'll be doing in this next workshop. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the final thing that I wanted to touch on, um, 16S copy number. Um, so we know that bacteria and archaea often have multiple 16S copies in their genome. Um, and if we're saying that a unique sequence means it's a different species, that can be problematic when, um, you know, some taxa might have between one and 15 copies of the 16S RNA gene in their genome. Um, and 16S copies can be diverse even within the same genome. Sometimes they're identical, oftentimes they're not. 
they might not be very different from one another, um, but they could be a little different at least. Um, and so this study was quite a while ago now, but I think their results stand um, that, you know, they look at the proportion of genomes that have multiple 16S copies. You do see that two is kind of the most frequent number. So you're not usually looking at like 15, but that is possible. But as the number of 16S copies per genome increases, the diversity between those copies also increases. Um, so this is how similar they are, but kind of opposite, I guess. Um, so it's just really worth bearing in mind that that is the case. Um, and that those numbers per genome do vary somewhat by phyla, but it's not consistent. Um, even between like multiple strains of E. coli, I'm pretty sure some of them have different numbers of 16S copies. So you can't really guess at how many there might be in certain taxa. It's really difficult to correct for. Um, a few tools have attempted to correct, and that's based on, you know, it being somewhat conserved between similar taxa. Um, but because of this issue, most people don't correct for 16S copy number. Uh, I personally wouldn't when I'm doing an analysis. And I think it's then just worth bearing in mind that you are kind of looking at your 16S RNA gene population, not your cellular population um, when you're looking at the sequenced community. Um, and so, yeah, like there was this kind of, I mean, it's a few years old, but I think it still stands. I'm not aware of anyone that has suddenly solved this problem. Um, yeah, so that kind of takes me through to what I was going to cover on that. Um, I just want to really briefly touch on reproducibility and research. Um, so, yeah, you use a lab work for keeping track of what you do in the wet lab. It makes sense, therefore, that you need to do something to keep track of what you do for bioinformatics. Often when you're writing up papers, it is years after you actually did the bioinformatic analysis, especially once you've like run and rerun tools and, you know, it, you never just run through something once. If anyone ever does that, like, please <laughs> let me know. Um, but it's never just once. Um, it's always multiple times. So it can be really useful to have some method for keeping track of what you've run, when you run it, which projects you're running it on. Um, and also when you're troubleshooting, it's useful to keep track of what you have previously tried so that you aren't trying to do it again. I find I often have like a mental block when something didn't work and it was just really frustrating to overcome. And I almost forget completely that that ever happened until I run into the same problem again. Like how on earth did I overcome this before? Um, so it's really useful to keep track of this in some way. There are a few different tools that are used. Um, some of you may be familiar with GitHub. This tends to be for kind of version control more than anything. Um, it kind of, it's like using track changes in a Word document almost. Um, that if you keep updating to your own repository, then it will keep track of what you changed in each version. So you could look at, you know, what, if you make sure that you do that every day, for example, you can then look at, you know, what was it that I had three days ago that worked and now I've broken this. Um, then you also have R notebooks, which is what I like to use. And you may be aware R is, you know, one of the com most commonly used programming languages. R notebooks are not only for R, code, you can have different code chunks within them. Um, and then there's Jupyter notebooks as well. And that's almost like a Python equivalent of the R notebooks. Um, I will go through the R notebooks briefly, just because that's what I have typically used. Um, but yeah, there are options, uh, but it is really good. And some people even just have like a text document that they store the changes in. Um, I wouldn't recommend something like Word because some of you may have found out already, as you copy and paste things in from different places, if they format punctuation differently, it can make your code not run. It's really annoying to try and troubleshoot because it looks identical, but it's not. Um, so I recommend having something like this. Um, and what I like about like our notebooks or the Jupyter notebooks is that you can write commentary around it very easily. Um, sorry? You can. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you definitely can. I mean, what I like about the R notebooks is that 
you know, you're going to run some stuff command line, then you might be running R or Python for your analysis. You can keep it all in the same document and you can even like read things into the other programming language using it. Um, so it's, it's really nice for that. Um, so this is kind of, this is the example just taken from the R website, like the R notebooks website, but essentially you have um, kind of a, side on here so you've got these bits of code so this is exactly how we wrote the um, workshop tutorials um you have these bits of code and then you have some text around it you can have plots displayed in in line and you can actually export this as an html document that you could send to a collaborator and they can look through they can look at your plot and then they can see the code that you use to make that plot um so it's really nice for that uh, i wish i had discovered these kind of earlier in my academic journey I guess. Um, and then you often have like this display on the right, it can vary. At the moment, you can see what it's going to look like as the HTML document on when it comes out. So you can choose to hide the code or show the code. Uh, you have a console at the bottom, which is essentially like your terminal or party window, but it can be either R or Python or Bash, any of these programming languages. Um, and for anyone that wants to, for the remainder of the modules, we have the option for you to either work through them online as you did for the first one, or you can download the R notebooks that we made. So if you want to make changes within them, then it's a lot easier to make the changes and see what you used in the future. Um, kind of gives you a bit of practice, but if you are already feeling kind of overwhelmed with the first one, then feel free to just carry on working through it online in the same way. <clears throat> 